Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Alejandro Gallardo. I'm a game director at Sumo Massive Games. And today I'm going to be talking about creating a VR action horror game. Switchback VR Lessons Learned. Um, the idea with this talk is to go through how we went about creating a VR action horror game and what sort of takeaways we got at the end of the project. And I would recommend to, to for everyone trying to do a VR game. Um, kind of a bit of myself, um, I started um, some, a bit more than 17 years ago in a company called Digital Chocolate where I created a bunch of uh, small mobile games um, where the time where there were no iPhones and stuff like that so I uh, managed to learn a lot of things there where uh, the company shifted to a free to play towards the end of the time I was there so I learned a bit more of uh, not only game design but uh, monetization which was quite nice. Then from there I moved to uh, Gameloft at Gameloft Madrid in Spain where I started working on what they, you can consider a bit of like a triple A uh, mobile games. Still free to play but more kind of heavy on systems and, and level design. From there I moved to Square Enix where I was lucky enough to work on all the Life is Strange franchise amongst all the titles um, and then I worked as well on some small titles at the beginning of my time there uh, were more, more free to play and first person shooters. Then after my time at Square Enix I basically uh, went and moved to Supermassive Games. I had a very uh, strong passion about creating uh, horror games and then I got an opportunity to work on Switchback VR which is a PSVR 2 exclusive game like a horror action trolley coaster uh, experience. Um, so I'm going to be talking on uh, during this talk about a bit of my experience uh, for creating games and how uh, that applies applied to uh, Switchback VR and how we did some transitions to well some some speci special cases that we needed to consider when doing a VR game. And just in case not many of you know what uh, Switchback VR is, let me show you a small trailer of the game. In your darkest moment. Can you hear me? Stay with me. Um, in a, a bit more of a bit over two years of development, and um, and it was uh, the first time I created a VR game. Me and the core team, uh, none of us worked on a VR game before, so we learned through a lot of experience of doing things the wrong way, um, and some in a good way, um, to create kind of the experience that you've seen there. So this talk is going to be structured into kind of three big different um, sections, which is one, it's going to be about the pre-production of how we were creating the vision of the game and how we communicated the vision to the team. Then another one, which is a bit more of creating the game itself, some uh, from the design point of view and some art point of view, some considerations we need to have a look. And then lastly, but not least, uh, is about the lessons we learned from uh, different stages and different things you need to take into account. Okay. 
first of all, creating the vision. Um, so first of all, what I always say, like I think this does not only apply to VR, but uh, it's always, uh, for me at least, it's been very interesting to create a very defined and strong pillars for the product, what you want your experience to be uh, in this case. We wanted basically one of the things that was really key for the project was immersion. We wanted the player to feel they were there in the environment, that they were part of like that roller coaster, they were inside a theme park, so it needed to have that feeling of you being there. That was a key thing for us that then trans transpired to the rest of the uh, of the project. Another thing was very important, it was we wanted to create an experience that kind of showcased a bit of a action, arcade action, like and giving what was, was more important for us was the sense of power. And we'll talk a bit more about this, which how can we achieve the sense of power in a VR game. Right. And then of course, uh, this is a horror game, so one of the key pillars was horror. And this was very, very important for the entire project. And we spent quite a lot of time trying to kind of balance this. And again, when creating uh, different aspects of the game, we always looked at these three pillars and we see if any of the features or any of the things we were creating supported one, one or more of these pillars. And if we didn't uh, support any of those, then we would uh, that would be like a thing that we will uh, select to cut or not import, not as important to say. Out of these, uh, as you said, uh, as you as you saw before, we tried to create a horror game. So we were part of the Dark Pictures games, and something we we were very keen on. We had four main games on the on the. On the brand, which was uh, Devil in Me, House of Ashes, um, House, uh, Devil in Me, House of Ashes, uh, Man of Adan, and Little Hope, which is four different games that we could drink from and bring into this. So that gave us a bit of the uh, idea to create that kind of feeling of a theme park. However, a good thing and a bad thing as well is that we had four types of horror. So we had Man of Medan, which was a reflecting of a ghost ship, zombies style of horror, which uh, gave us a lot of opportunities to get that kind of zombie feeling or that desperation of being trapped on a ship, which was quite nice. Then Little Hope, which was based, uh, the horror what we embraced there was witches and forest. So if you've seen the ritual or the witch, it was more of a being part of a, being in the middle of a cold, uh, lost in the woods, not knowing where to go, feeling lost, feeling seen. Um, and that was quite interesting to kind of try to showcase this. Then House of Ashes is kind of like a monster sort of uh, story, like Aliens of the Sand, where we get some people going down into a kind of like excavation in Syria and then kind of finding creatures there. So we wanted to tap into that type of horror. And the last one was Devil in Me, which is kind of a bit of a slasher body horror, which is a, it takes place in a hotel, in a haunted in a hotel, where there is a, a, basically a killer trying to use traps and kind of different things in the hotel to get you. All right, so if you think about Saw, Chainsaw Stens, Chainsaws, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, sorry, this is what we're trying to achieve there. Um, but one big thing, as you could see here, when we were actually creating the vision, you could see there is four types of horror, which going, and we had a lot of assets and a lot of things that we wanted to reuse and 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 and, and to, to kind of um, showcase that sort of horror. But each one of them is very different. So we needed a theme on top that gave us that feeling of being on a roller coaster, or being on a theme park. That if you go to any of those parks, you'll see that there is always kind of like a common kind of language to use across the entire thing, even if everything is completely different. In our case with uh, Switchback, it was a demonic uh, sort of uh, theme. And we use references like Hellraiser with kind of chains, leather, 
Hiron, sinister for the kind of symbology of the demons, the demon that eats in there, uses a specific sort of sigil, and kind of insidious on the nouns like that the conjuring universe, which uses quite a lot of specific language. So with this, basically what we did is create a visual identity for the game that we will apply to every one of those themes. And no matter where you go, you will always feel kind of that, that you steal on the same ride, you steal on the same park, or you steal on the same uh, same game, right? You wouldn't feel like it's completely different. This was very important to them to find some custom enemies that we had and the story that we wanted to tell in this in this game. Right. Then um, we did a quite of extensive research. Uh, so for each one of the pillars, uh, so basically for the immersion, uh, what we did is played a lot of VR games. More specifically, VR games as well to kind of try to portray some of that uh, feeling that we wanted to show, like uh, you know, Rush of Blood, or in VR Worlds there was a game to the bottom of the ocean with a uh, big shark or Alex for the control system that was quite nice. But we didn't only stop there in the um, in the in the kind of games. So we went and experienced roller coaster, went to theme parks at Disney. Or even we went to scare parks across Europe to see how kind of you know how everything is presented and get that feeling of immersion and presence that we wanted to give later on. Then in terms of arcade action, we researched a lot of shooting games on VR, like Little Truth, Truth Super Hot VR. This well we used like arcade machines from Time Crisis or House of the Dead. How the gameplay felt. As well, we use a lot of references from John Wick, Tony Blum, and Hardcore Henry, and a lot of other action movies to see not only how the guns were used, but how the sounds of those guns uh, felt. And in terms of horror, we did play quite a bit of VR horror games and not VR horror games to give us what was important to those uh, VR experiences. But as well, we went into and done some escape rooms, horror escape rooms, and as kind of like similar to the immersion, we went to some uh, uh, scare parks to get this kind of immersive feeling what we wanted to transmit that way to the player. As well, we saw a couple of, um, a lot of movies about horror, but not only that, there was a couple of documentaries like History of Horror from Eddie Roth, which was quite nice, analyzing kind of genres inside horror. Then, in, once we had all this, we kind of wanted to, you want to kind of um, showcase this to the team. What well, we released is create a list of references for everyone that joined the team. Uh, so we created a playlist of music uh, to kind of, so people could put that playlist while they were working, if they wanted to, of course, and kind of get immersed into the soundscape that we wanted for the game, right? Then we did a bunch of key arts for different places for each one of the themes, the main theme, to kind of give the mood to what we were trying to achieve, as well as creating a movie list for the theme. Then this kind of was always there so people can always check, but throughout the entire process, we kept doing kind of watching documentaries, doing round tables, creating workshops, Cross-disciplinary, this was very important because usually people tend to do um, a lot of brainstorming workshops on their own um, departments. It was very interesting to see how all the departments kind of work together. And as well, we kept going to escape rooms and all experiences uh, throughout the entire process. Cool. So now that we're here, now how we went about to create the game. So... Uh, you, you need, need to consider certain sort of things when you start creating VR games. One of and, and kind of one of the biggest ones for us was you have no camera control, and this was very important because you cannot move the camera. I mean, you can, but uh, that will create probably some dizziness to the player. So you need to control very clearly how and very careful how you move. Uh, but not only that, you do not know where the player is looking at any given time. Therefore, um, 
grabbing the attention of the players was very important and it is very important. Then uh, in case of PSVR 2, some of the features on PSVR 2 like eye tracking or rumble on the headset uh, can be disabled. Therefore, you needed to create systems that will still work when those uh, features were not enabled, right? And then of course, testing. How how much like uh, creating focus tests and so on, uh, and even testing in, in in the studio for developers testing this will take time, and you need to consider this. And we'll talk later on. You need to consider this into your schedule to make sure you understand that testing on VR is not the same as testing on your PC or your console, right? Uh, not only this, in terms of camera controls, you need to be aware as well that all the effects that you usually have on a normal game, like chromatic aberration, certain uh, kind of effects that you might do on the camera lens, will not work or will work not as you want it on a VR. So when trying to do all those things, you need to take into account that may they may not work or they may give a very dizzy or weird uh, sensation to the players. Then something else we started doing a lot was creating a set of guidelines and rule sets, rule sets to create the game. In our case, because it was a roller coaster that uh, you will be moving most of the time uh, so we started creating a, some prototypes where we experimented with shooting uh, stationary targets, moving target, and so on. We checked how much uh, maximum speed that you could reach without getting dizzy or without feeling really bad, uh, how the turns should go, and you know, creating, creating that rule set to create the roller coaster. Not only that, kind of creating rule sets for dodging obstacles. It's quite nice that you know you be able to move while uh, you know playing to avoid objects and things like this. However, the amount of movement of your head needs to be considered so people do not get exhausted uh, while, while playing, and as well as uh, how to create puzzles on a on a place where you keep uh, on experience that you keep constantly moving. Not only that, but as well, as important as the other ones, we created e-testing rules. So uh, this was very important and we discovered it the wrong way. Uh, like for example, give you kind of a bit of, so when, when to test and how to test the game. In our case, for example, it was very important not to test the game after lunch or after you have uh, eaten something uh, because it could provoke quite dizziness or if you're not feeling very well, or we were said about taking breaks, if you uh, test for a long period of time, or for example, not touching someone that is testing because that could scare that person and that will not be good, right? And it has happened by, by mistake sometimes that you kind of approach someone like you do in an office and touch them, like, hey, how are you doing? Or kind of try to talk to them and they kind of jump and nearly punched different people because of it. So uh, these are kind of were very, very interesting and important to get. Now, once you start building your systems, uh, we wanted to create a sense of power. Uh, to create sense of power, what we did is kind of work a lot into the feeling of the weapons. So how uh, it will feel kind of uh, shooting. So thank Thanks to the uh, PSVR 2, we had haptic feedback and adaptive triggers that allow us to kind of create that kind of resistance on the gun, on the trigger, and not only that, kind of be able to reproduce the feeling of the gun in your hand uh, with the haptics. Uh, we kind of created a lot of different types of weapons. So because if you get used to one single weapon, you will probably your sense of power will start decreasing. So we keep getting uh, players different type of weapons to to keep that sense of power. As well, we try to give a very unique identity per each gun that we had. So, uh, it, you know, if you try to reproduce a normal uh, gun sound, it's actually quite small and tiny. But if you, for example, grab uh, John Wick and you could hear 
the gunshots are kind of very amplified and very it feels very strong so we use we use kind of like an audio identity for that and not only that we use a 3d audio therefore it was not the same if you were kind of aiming kind of very far away from you or you were firing next to you the feeling of kind of proximity was quite big we created as well a heat reaction system with the enemies and the environment to kind of give you that feeling every single time you kind of hit something and then as well we did consider for some time to see if we could have weapon jamming or something like this and uh, it was very uh so we, we tried it but we felt like it was very uh it felt very wrong and actually you kind of lost your sense of power even having a gun i was more of a nuisance than anything else however because it is a horror game kind of getting a gun and feeling powerful it's quite tough to then instill horror so what we did is when we didn't want you to use the weapons we removed the weapons from you it did create create a bit of a um, kind of uh, frustration but you did understand automatically that you could not shoot anything then when we wanted to create uh, different types of enemies, but well, we kind of we were kind of focused on doing horror and fear-led design. So uh, for the custom, so we heard a lot of enemies from the main Dark Pictures games, uh, but we created a bunch of enemies that were kind of uh, for ourselves, for our, our game basically, and that sort of enemies we kind of did a bit of research into kind of type of phobias and what people are afraid not only that but to create the animations even on the enemies that we had we created uh kind of specific kind of uh movements and uh let's say sounds to kind of evoke those kind of uh phobias and or, or fears right as well the fighting mechanics we were considering as well how um encounters and with combat design how we approach encounters where you feel extremely powerful with weapons so how can we make you feel not that powerful in terms of to instill less fear so for example there are scenes where we inundate entire room with a uh, fog therefore even if you can shoot you cannot see where the enemies come from and creating kind of a bit of a chaos in that sense Right. So we tried always to design every combat encounter or any fighting mechanic that we had with uh, with with that in mind. Right. Then for this uh, sense of presence that we wanted to instill, basically we created a roller coaster, so a cart, and a cart in a roller coaster. Sorry, where you could see and feel kind of where you were, and we put a lot of details inside the cart. So. It felt like you were there, same as we kind of grab only your hands with gloves. So it felt like um, you were part of, of, it was you that was there, not another character. Then we used the blinking and eye tracking mechanic to look around and being able to kind of um, trigger different scenes based on what you're looking at. Therefore, always we knew where players were looking and we always uh, were able to trigger some of the events therefore if someone was looking up to the right we can trigger something there but if we're looking to the left then there was triggered something there and they will always feel there was something going on uh, as well we use the rumble of the headset when you get hit by objects to again get that feeling of you were there haptics were not only used for weapons but for rain you could feel and you could see on your gloves the rain and you could feel the rain on the haptics but as well when you go up on those roller coaster moments where you your track keeps going track 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 then as well we tried to use the uh, diegetic ui which was very important for us so again not to break that immersion therefore everything we did was either on the card or on the weapons themselves now when we went to create uh the create the levels were important during the level design we created e pacing documents and the floor plans very early on deciding which moment which moment to moment what uh, sort of feelings we wanted to give it was an intense roller coaster a heavy action or horror or mix of two of them 
uh, then we went into creating the spline and the kind of white boxing of those environments and uh, it's very important that when we created the white boxing we created all the key scripted events to see if they worked on the meantime we had a production design team to kind of start sketching every single of those key scenes to give the mood and the rest of the departments a bit more information now uh once we went into those specific designs or specific scenes uh, like for example this scene that i told you about you were in the middle of the forest the cart starts stopping you hear kind of a laughter from a demon going left to right you hear a bit of a, a wind blowing and then suddenly the whole a lot of fog kind of comes in you keep hearing people moving around you but every single time you move or you look into different directions they were not um doesn't seem to be anyone or you only see shadows or you see shadows on the corner of your eyes and then suddenly we start seeing shadows in front of you with a very strong light at the back and then we start kind of pumping up the music quite high now what we did for this is we need to, to identify and have the identity of the scene and look for references not only in games but in other mediums in this case as you can imagine we use the reference of the mist and then kind of play play with a bit of lighting to kind of attract the vision on the or the eyes of the players to different places then once we have something like this we created audio previews to play with the non-diegetic to see how that felt and then kind of in, integrated those case events to kind of give you that feeling of i'm looking here but then i'm having something on the uh corner of my eyes Okay. And then something that we always try to work into is like work uh, how to balance the horror and action. As you saw there, basically what something we found is like always leading up with horror, which is usually feeling powerless. Uh, and that is very important to get the feeling that you're very vulnerable, that you're about to get something and then kind of amp up to a point where you can either have the jump scare or you kind of trigger straight away into action where players feel that they can shoot in anything in, in moves right. and kind of the last part of this is kind of going into lessons learned so things that we learned through the process so uh, at high level uh, it's very important that you define very early on the experience that you want to uh, create it's very very important to focus on one or two experiences do not try to do a lot uh, otherwise you kind of start confusing the players then uh, because it's a VR because it's an experience it's very important to go more uh, kind of reach a bit more than what it is uh, games and try to kind of go and experience different things in real life to see how those felt so you can try to uh, kind of put those into the game then this is very important is find different ways to trans uh, to communicate your vision a lot of people kind of do pbts or they do big talks and stuff like that which is quite nice but uh you need to different ways through videos through audios through music through uh, experiences to try to communicate that vision not to your core team but every single member that comes to the, your team which is very important leads to this which is make sure you take enough time to introduce new members to your vision why is this important because later on down the line when there's a lot of stress and you keep getting a lot of people into the project you need to take time so they understand what you're trying to build and what's the experience you're trying to get now another big thing is beware when you team start building tolerance to vr during the, the the two years and something that we uh, created the game at the beginning we had a very low tolerance to the vr the more we used the more tolerance we were therefore we couldn't feel how easy uh, uh, uh coaster coaster was, was or not, not. So, so we made to keep uh, getting new people to test the game for us sometimes plan your focus test this, this is very important to do from the very beginning and i'll say this because not all the testing facilities will have VR and if they do have VR they will have not that many headsets so they will have to book things in advance and your audience might be quite reduced 
And this is not something that we discovered the wrong way, which is please do not create videos for reviewing. Uh, this is quite common where you kind of create a bunch of videos of levels and experiences and then send it to different directors to review and people make comments on those videos. The problem with creating videos is the experience that you see in the video is not the same experience that you see on the R. Therefore, when you give a feedback about something being too slow or not uh, intense enough, might not be the reality inside the headset. So it's very important that anyone that needs to review the game or the scene puts the VR headset on. Create your memory budget very early on. This is extremely important, I said even in pre-production, pre because you need to get them to be running 60 frames per second, otherwise you will get your team sick. Then build metrics so you can gather information again very early on in the process we took a bit of time to do this and then we paid kind of towards the end and allocate enough time to test on vr this is more important when uh milestones and certain uh moments arrive because you will have not many people being able to have time to put a headset on and this is key to be able to understand if you've done a good job on different disciplines so having that time is very important. And then be aware of the health of your team. QA, for example, uh, and, and other disciplines that need to test very, very often might be getting very tired. So you need to have more breaks and you need to have more time to cool down after an intense session. So make sure people don't get sick. Just, just to give you the example, I kind of encapsulate some of this. Uh, earlier on in the project, uh, I was testing one of the one of the levels uh, where basically we kind of we kind of had a bug. Uh, we've been testing for quite a bit of time, and then the the roller coaster started going 200 kilometers hour. Uh, and not only that, but then the frame rate dropped to 40 frames per second at the same time as it was accelerating. And I basically got pulled out the entire day of how this year felt as soon as that hit. And I was in there for two, three seconds till I kind of removed the entire headset of the head. So this is kind of, it is kind of a joke, but it can be very problematic. In terms of building lesson, building systems, lessons we learn, it's very important that every feature uh, and system uh, is in support of your pillars. If they're not, please cut them because you will have hard time trying to retrofit them in there it's important that all your tech uh, all the tech specs are building your systems from the very beginning uh, in our case for example the eye tracking came very late on the development process so that's why for example we had to retrofit a lot of the designs into the existing game um, remember that you're developing for VR that means that when creating encounters, when creating a new weapon, when creating a new enemy, make sure you put your headset on and see how that feels inside VR. I know, I've been re repeating a lot of tests on VR, but this was something that was very key. Another thing is that careful with sensory overload, uh, having a, a lot of BFX, sound effects, enemies on the screen, plus the UI of the splat splatter, and then you had your, your vibration on the head and your haptics on the hand can easily, easily make, a pe make people and players very tired. So if you need to have a lot of these things in, you need to create a priority to uh, only display the ones or display or show uh, the ones that are more important. This is key, otherwise all your scenes will feel very chaotic and, and people will feel actually very dizzy with them. Another thing is prototype your UI very early on to see how it feels with the entire game. Moreover, if you want to do a UI that's diegetic. And then, as I said, test every single feature on VR. Now for level design lessons, uh, keep in mind your visuals from the very beginning. For example, lighting doesn't work exactly the same, so something on your screen looks with a very nice lighting, will look very different once you put the headset on. So again, your lighting artists need to have that headset uh, and testing their lighting 
solutions in the headsets. Proportions and animations will feel extremely different. Proportions, for example, when you create characters that are kind of normal height, they might feel quite small. So make sure you test all your assets in the VR headset from the very beginning so you know if the proportions are good or not. Uh, something we found out as well is that 3D audio is key to lead players to see what you want to see. Not only that, but uh, uh, kind of lighting as well. But having that sense of presence and getting something from the back so you can kind of help guide where players are looking into. Right. Then the horror scenes, when you are going to be lab those horror scenes, keep in mind that you need to build up that horror horror doesn't it's not about the jump scare it's about the anticipation it's about slowing down everything about kind of creating that dim light that some, suddenly kind of goes off with wind it is very important uh to create that build up more than the final kind of jump scare at the end be focused and deliberate on the pacing of your sins which is do not do more than two things at once in one specific scene. So if you want to do horror and roller coaster, or if you want to do uh, horror and action, and action and roller coaster, it's very important that you focus on one or two areas only. Uh, so you can kind of put all your efforts to create that. And beware of the head movements when creating encounters. It's nothing more annoying than asking players to move from side to side uh which is very very uh exhausting doing once or twice is very interesting but when you create your encounters make sure that you kind of put things kind of in different orders so players keep looking now putting one there on one on the other side where you could get players looking that's fine but not constant otherwise again people are going to start feeling dizzy they're going to start moving a lot the head and it gets very tiring and of course, test every single part of your level on VR because it does not feel the same as testing it on, on the screen. Cool. And with that, I hope uh, it's it's good and you all enjoyed this talk. Um, reach me on any of my social medias or LinkedIn and have a great rest of uh, the talks. Bye.